Warning, the following story contains descriptions of graphic violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Approximately 15,000 people are reported missing in Mexico every year. This is the case of Mark Kilroy. Mark James Kilroy was born on March 5, 1968 in Chicago, Illinois. His parents were James William Kilroy, a chemical engineer, and Helen Josephine Kilroy, a volunteer paramedic. They moved to Texas from the Midwest after their son was born. Kilroy grew up in Santa Fe, Texas, a small town outside of Houston, for over 15 years along with his brother, Keith Richard Kilroy. He was raised as a Catholic and his parents were frequent attendees at Our Lady of Our Lord's Catholic Church in the adjacent town of Hitchcock, Texas. Kilroy excelled both in academics and athletics as a teenager and played baseball, basketball, and golf with his friends at school. He was in the Boy Scouts of America and an honor student at Santa Fe High School where he was a member of the student council and was ranked 14th in a class of 210 students. Upon graduation in 1986, he attended Southwest State Texas University in San Marcos, Texas before transferring to Tarleton State University in Stephenville, Texas on a basketball scholarship. At Tarleton, he became a member of the Lambda Chi Alpha fraternity. Then he decided to give up his athletics and transfer to the University of Texas at Austin to become a pre-med student and prepare for his medical college admission. On March 10, 1989, Kilroy's childhood friend Bradley Moore finished exams early at Texas A&M University and headed to Austin to pick him up. Both of them then headed to Santa Fe to pick up two other friends, Bill Huddleston and Brent Martin, before heading to South Padre Island, Texas for spring break. After a foggy nine-hour drive to South Texas, they arrived at South Padre Island shortly after midnight. They checked in at the Sheraton Hotels and Resorts the next morning before heading to the beach. When they first arrived at South Padre Island, there were few people because it was very early in the five-week spring break season. But thousands of students from the entire U.S. were beginning to arrive as the weekend progressed. Beer sponsors were staging a variety of entertainment events, including free movies, music concerts, calls home, surf simulator activities, and opportunities to appear on TV commercials. Kilroy and Moore made free phone calls to their parents that day. Later that evening, they met a group of female students from Purdue University and partied until the next morning. The following morning, Kilroy and his friends had more or less a daily routine in mind. They went to the beach in the morning and suntanned before lunch. After lunch, they went to the beach area behind their hotel for the daily Miss Tan Line contest. Once the event was over that afternoon, Kilroy headed to the hotel for a quick nap before planning their trip to Mexico. They left South Padre Island that evening and stopped for dinner at a Sonic Drive in Port Isabel, Texas, where they met a group of female students from the University of Kansas who were planning to party in Mexico as well. The women then followed Moore's car from Port Isabel to Brandsville and parked their cars close to a Gateway International Bridge before crossing the U.S.-Mexico border on foot. Kilroy's friends and the Kansas women spent most of their evening at Sgt. Pepper's nightclub in Matamoros before the groups went on their separate ways. Kilroy and his friends then returned to South Padre Island early the next morning. On March 13th, Kilroy and his friends attended another Miss Tan Line contest behind the Sheraton. Early that evening, Kilroy met with one of his former frat brothers at a condo party. At around 10.30 p.m., Kilroy and his friends headed back to Matamoros. They parked their car on the border and crossed on foot again. That night, Matamoros was flooded with 15,000 spring break tourists from the U.S. on the city's main tourist street, Alvaro Obregón. The sidewalks, street, and nightclubs were packed with foreign tourists looking to enjoy cheap alcohol and enjoy Mexico's lax drinking laws. When they got to Matamoros, Kilroy and his friends decided to go to the bar with the shortest waiting line. They ended up at Los Sombreros, a bar with rock music and bright neon. After a few drinks, Kilroy and his friends left Los Sombreros and wandered to the London pub, which rebranded itself as Hard Rock Cafe for spring break. This bar was louder and wilder than Los Sombreros, 
and Kilroy and his friends stood at the bar while other tourists threw beer from the balcony. Kilroy met with a few women at the bar and was not seen by his friends for a while. Around 2 a.m., Huddleston suggested the group head back to the South Padre Island. As his friends stepped out of London Pub, they saw Kilroy leaning against a car and talking to a woman from Miss Tanline. Across Alvaro Obregon Street, thousands of tourists were leaving the bars and heading to Brownsville, but others moved in different directions. The large crowd of people made it difficult for Kilroy and his friends to walk across the border uninterrupted and in a group. Moore and Martin separated from the group and walked to Garcia's, a popular restaurant slash store close to the border. Kilroy stopped at the steps of a house on Elvaro Obregon to say goodbye to the woman from Miss Tanline. He then waited for Huddleston to walk towards him. Huddleston then ran to a nearby alley to urinate while Kilroy waited for him. By the time Huddleston came out and caught up with the other two near Garcia's, Kilroy had vanished. His friends searched for him for hours, even after the establishments had closed and the streets had cleared at around 4.30 a.m. They then crossed the border, thinking Kilroy may have crossed to Brownsville and was perhaps waiting near their parked car. His friends did not find him near their car and waited a few minutes in Brownsville before returning to South Padre Island. They thought that Kilroy probably left for the hotel with someone else. They woke up the next day at the hotel and Kilroy's whereabouts were still unknown. His friends then contacted the police to report him missing. The search for Kilroy initially began as the routine missing persons investigation. Students that were reported missing in Matamoros in the past would often turn up in the following days with a hangover and blurry memory of what had happened to him. Kilroy was one of the 60 people who had disappeared in Matamoros in the first three months of 1989. However, his case drew more attention in the U.S. because his uncle, Ken Kilroy, worked at the United States Customs Service in Los Angeles. When the news reached his uncle, a police task force was created in Brownsville to search for Kilroy. Alarmed with the bad publicity of his disappearance and the potential effects of tourism in Matamoros, local police officers tried to shift the blame and suggested that Kilroy had disappeared in Brownsville. Kilroy's friends denied such claims. The Mexican Federal Police Force vowed to work on the case and help U.S. investigators. One of the commanders assigned Mexican agents to the U.S. officials to accompany them in Matamoros. Together, they questioned informants, potential witnesses, and worked on tips provided by their sources. Both Mexican and U.S. authorities suspected that Kilroy's disappearance involved foul play. They speculated that Kilroy could have been a victim of drug-related violence or of robbery killing. But then they were short on leads to make any firm conclusions. When Kilroy's friends reported the disappearance, customs agents went with them to Matamoros to help retrace their steps. Texan officials contacted the U.S. consulate in Matamoros and asked investigators to carry out a search with Kilroy's description in Matamoros jails and hospitals. Investigators then hired a hypnotist to see if he can figure out some additional clues. Under hypnosis, Moore stated that he saw a young Hispanic man wearing a blue plaid shirt with a visible scar across his face talking to Kilroy before he disappeared. He recalled that the man walked up to Kilroy and told him, Hey, don't I know you from somewhere? Though Huddleston said he was not sure if Kilroy responded, however, None of the friends were able to precisely recall the exact moment or place where Kilroy disappeared. Investigators deducted by their story and Kilroy was kidnapped for robbery or ransom. The first option seemed the most likely because his abductors had not called for a payment. They believed that Kilroy's body was probably dumped in a remote location. Helicopters and terrain vehicles of the United States Border Patrol were called to look on the Rio Grande River, but this body was not found. During the investigation, Kilroy's parents headed to the Rio Grande Valley and circulated more than 20,000 handouts throughout the region and offered a $15,000 reward to anyone who could help locate their son. They met with Attorney General Jim Maddox of Texas and the Governor William Clements and the U.S. Senator Lloyd Benson to assist them on the case. 
Texan officials told Kilroy's parents that they were planning to talk to Tamaulipas Governor Americo Valerio Guerra and get more people from Matamoros involved in their son's disappearance. People from Kilroy's hometown traveled to Matamoros and issued flyers offering a reward to anyone who could provide information on his safe return. U.S. authorities had praised the efforts of the Mexican Federal Police on the case, but they distrusted the state and the municipal officials. They suspected that because state and local authorities were acting slowly and not sharing enough information, Kilroy's murderers had insiders within their ranks. On March 26th, the case was highlighted on national television in the crime show America's Most Wanted. This gave the case nationwide attention and generated several phone calls and letters with people giving clues on Kilroy's whereabouts. However, the police stated that none of the leads generated were solid enough to pursue. A few days later, Kilroy's parents returned to Santa Fe. Santa Fe residents raised money through a garage sales and car washes to help Kilroy's family continue their search. In addition, Kilroy's parents went to the University of Texas at Austin to withdraw for their son from school. The key break in the case came on April 1, 1989. Mexican federales manning a drug interdiction checkpoint saw a vehicle run the roadblock without stopping. The vehicle had crossed the international border from Texas and sped through Mexican Federal Highway 2, which connects Matamoros and Reynosa Tamaulipas. Instead of turning on their police sirens and stopping the truck, the police decided to follow it using an unmarked vehicle. The checkpoint runner then traveled out to Santa Elena Ranch outside Matamoros. The police pulled off at a distance to observe. After about 30 minutes, the driver of the truck took off from the ranch and headed back to the city. The officers decided to make their move on the ranch. In a quick search, the police discovered cult paraphernalia and marijuana traces. Police determined that the driver of the truck was Serafin Hernandez Garcia, the nephew of a local drug lord whose operations were based around the ranch area. But instead of arresting Hernandez Garcia, the police decided to continue gathering more evidence on the suspected criminal activities at the ranch and the organized crime members involved with the Hernandez family. They used informants in the Matamoros to inquire on family activities at Santa Elena in order to make a series of crucial arrests. On April 9th, they returned with several other policemen and arrested Hernandez Garcia, his uncle Elio Hernandez Rivera, cult members David Serna Valdez and Sergio Martinez Salinas, and Domingo Reyes Busmante, the ranch's caretaker. While in custody, the detainees were very relaxed. They were sent to jail while the police interrogated other caretakers at the ranch. This person revealed to the police that the ranch had frequent visitors from Serafin's criminal group. The ranch's caretaker identified Kilroy through a photograph and stated that he saw him at the ranch. Yeah, the caretaker told the police, I saw him. Then he pointed at the shack at the ranch. When the police interrogated Hernandez Garcia separately, he confessed that several people, including Kilroy, had been killed over the course of several months at Santa Elena. Hernandez Garcia said that the slayings had been ordered by Adolfo Constanzo, a cult leader who practiced a ritual form of human sacrifice in the belief that it would provide supernatural protection for the drug gang. Constanzo believed that the sacrificing his victims, those during the sacrifice were ensured strength, abundance, and immunity from law enforcement and injury. Hernandez Garcia said that Constanzo had ordered his men to find a white Anglo male to sacrifice. According to Serafin Hernandez Garcia, he and other members of the gang had mingled with the spring break students in Matamoros on the night of the 14th of March. As Kilroy stood on the street near his friends, one of the men lured him close to the truck. As Kilroy approached the vehicle, Hernandez Garcia and another cult member, Melio Fabio Ponce Torres, grabbed Kilroy and wrestled him inside the truck. One of the gangsters stopped for a few moments to catch his breath two blocks along the road. Kilroy broke loose and ran but was intercepted by another vehicle driven by the gangster's allies, who took him prisoner at gunpoint. He was then subdued and handcuffed in the back of the second car. The gangsters drove Kilroy through the back streets of the city and past an industrial area, passing through the city's outskirts to Santa Elena Ranch. The men left Kilroy inside the car overnight. Shortly after dawn, the ranch's caretaker went to see Kilroy and fed him bread, eggs, and water. 
about 12 hours after Kilroy was kidnapped, Constanzo and his men came to see him. They wrapped his face and mouth with duct tape and walked him through a field to a storage cabin with his hands still tied behind his back. Warning, the following story contains descriptions of graphic violence. Throughout the night of the 15th, Constanzo tortured and sodomized Kilroy. He was then led out to the field, where Constanzo killed him by chopping the back of his neck with a machete. His brain was then boiled in a nanga and an African metal pot that Constanzo used to stew human and animal remains. Kilroy's legs were chopped off above his knees to facilitate his burial. A wire was inserted in his spinal column so that once the body had decomposed, the bones could be pulled up from the soil easily. The cult members then dug a hole on the grounds and buried Kilroy's corpse. Hernandez Garcia agreed to take the police to the spot where Kilroy was buried, which was marked by the ends of the wire coming out of the dirt. Hernandez Garcia explained the functions of the wire. Once they retrieved the bones, cult members would wear them as necklaces to ward off danger and injury. On the 11th of April, police took Hernandez Garcia and the four other suspects to Santa Elena Ranch and forced them at gunpoint to spend several hours digging up the graves. Once Kilroy's corpse had been exhumed, the police observed that his legs were missing. Seraphin explained that the amputations were not a procedure of the ritual, but were done to simplify the burial. When the excavation was concluded, the suspects had unearthed 15 mutilated bodies, including Kilroy's all males who had been killed over a period of nine months. Kilroy's corpse was officially identified after the Brownsville police matched his dental records with the teeth found at the scene. Investigators concluded that most of the victims were rival drug dealers of the Costanzo and not random abductees like Kilroy. Three out of the 15 bodies were never identified. At Santa Elena, the Mexican police also seized 110 kilograms of marijuana 108 grams of cocaine and 12 firearms including three submachine guns and 11 vehicles some equipped with telephones inside an iron pot investigators discovered the remains of human brains a goat's head chicken feet a turtle several herbs a horseshoe and coins mixed with animal blood they also found no signs of cannibalism on the 12th of april the detainees were taken to the headquarters of the Mexican Federal Judicial Police in Matamoros for an informal press conference. More than 250 international journalists arrived at the scene to take pictures and ask them questions. The four suspects were paraded from the building's balcony and were allowed to answer questions from reporters. Elio Hernandez Rivera stated that he was an ordained executioner under Constanzo and that Constanzo himself had murdered Kilroy. As the camera zoomed in on the suspects, Hernandez Rivera showed his membership scars on his shoulders, back, arms, and chest. These were arrow-like cuts made with a hot blade. The marks were given to selected cult members with authority to perform human sacrifice. On April 13th, a religious ceremony initially intended to revive hope for Kilroy's safe return turned into a memorial service a day after his body was discovered. The lake service was held at Our Lady of Our Lord's Catholic Church in Santa Fe. Many local residents attended the service, and about 150 children pinned yellow ribbons outside the church's trees to rally in favor of Kilroy. After the ceremony, Kilroy's friends stated that they wished they had stayed in Texas to party instead of going to Mexico. At St. Luke's Catholic Church in Brownsville, over 1,200 people attended the memorial service to support Kilroy's parents. Several of the attendees wore yellow ribbons with Miss You Mark written on them and waited in line after the service was over to express their condolences to Kilroy's parents. The Kilroy family showed deep faith and conviction while speaking to the press. Kilroy's father spoke about the murder and told the press that they were not angry with the killers. He hoped that if when those responsible for Kilroy's death go to heaven and see their son, they can apologize to him for their wrongdoing. Kilroy's mother told others to pray for the murderers. On April 15th, Kilroy's parents met with U.S. President George H.W. Bush and William Bennett, who headed the Office of National Drug Control Policy. They told the politicians that for every drug consumer, there is a victim who suffers from their addiction. In addition, 
he stated that drug consumption should be treated with better education and that the use of drugs even casually causes suffering. Bush described the case as very sensitive and Bennett stated that Kilroy's murder was more nationwide and that the parents were able to turn their suffering to a very good effort. Two weeks after the bodies were exhumed from Santa Elena, the Mexican Federal Police returned to the ranch early in the morning to burn down the shack and lay a wooden cross above the ashes. Reportedly, the police took a folk healer to purify the shack before burning it down. The folk healer went inside the house, said a few prayers, sprinkled the floor with salt, and concluded by making the sign of the cross. The policemen then proceeded to spray gasoline around the shack before setting it on fire. The Mexican government offered no official explanation for their actions, but a source close to the investigation stated that the police's motives were supernatural in nature. They said that they knew the shack meant a lot to Constanzo, and burning it would make him go insane. We would hit him where it hurts, the police said. The next morning, Constanza reportedly went into a rage after the arson was shown on national television. By murdering Kilroy, Constanzo attracted international attention and forced the Mexican government to focus their efforts on bringing him and those involved to justice. On April 11, 1989, the day the bodies were exhumed from Santa Elena, Constanzo fled to a Holiday Inn in Brownsville before flying from McKellen, Texas to Mexico City where he had an apartment. He escaped with Sarah Aldrate, Martin Quintana Rodriguez, Omar Francisco, Oria Ochoa, and Alvaro de Leon Valdez. U.S. and Mexican law enforcement agencies carried out an international manhunt to locate Constanzo and the rest of his cult members. The police believed that Constanzo had possibly fled to Miami to visit his mother, but Constanzo opted for Mexico City where he hid with several of his followers for short periods of time. Rumors began to surface that Constanzo was seen in Chicago, Illinois. Other rumors suggested that Aldrate was spotted in schools throughout the Rio Grande Valley and that she had vowed to kidnap children for every jailed cult member. A convenience store clerk in Clovis, New Mexico called the police and told them that he had seen a couple matching the description of Constanzo and Aldrate stopping at his store to purchase something. According to investigators, Constanza was last seen driving a 1989 Mercedes-Benz in Brownsville. The Matamoros Law Enforcement raided Aldrate's house where they discovered an altar and several religious images. They also stated that the house's interior was covered with blood. In the Cameron County Sheriff's Office, authorities released a wanted poster of Constanzo stating that he was extremely dangerous and indicted him and Aldrate for aggravated kidnapping. Both were indicted by a state jury in McAllen, along with 11 other cult members from Costanzo's organization for importing marijuana, conspiracy to import marijuana, conspiracy to possess with the intent of distributing, and possession with the intent of distributing. Cameron County officials also issued an arrest warrants for other cult members who were at large. Although none of the leads proved successful, the police encouraged citizens to continue helping them in their search. On April 17th, Serafin Hernandez Rivera Sr., a Brownsville native, was arrested in Houston by DEA and Texas Department of Public Safety agents. Federal charges were filed against him for importing marijuana, possession, and conspiracy. Two other men implicated with him were Quintana Rodriguez and Ponce Torres, both Mexican citizens. As the police searched his Houston home, they seized cash and weapons, but found no evidence of any cult paraphernalia or leads pointing to Constanzo. Houston police believed that Constanzo was probably hiding in Houston because he was linked to a $20 million failed cocaine operation that was busted there in June 1988. When the house was raided, investigators found ritualistic candles, an altar, and paperwork with Rivera's name on it. The police believe that Constanzo bought several properties across Houston in the past and were investigating if he had visited any of his alleged hangouts. Serafin Sr. cooperated with U.S. officials and was sentenced to 18 months in prison. He was released in June 1990 and returned to Brownsville. On April 17th in Mexico City, the police raided one of Constanzo's properties in Adzipan. They discovered piles of homosexual pornography in a hidden ritual chamber with an altar. This prompted the police to question people in Mexico City's homosexual community and see if they had any leads on Constanzo's whereabouts. 
The Mexican police stated that no evidence was found at the scene to link Constanza or his men to any murders committed there. They said they saw altars and other ritualistic belongings, but did not find any traces of blood. No men were arrested at the scene, but the police managed to arrest a lady called Mar Maria Teresa Quintana Rodriguez, sister of one of Constanzo's lovers and henchmen. The police also discovered that Andrate's purses and other belongings were left behind, which prompted them to conclude that Constanzo probably murdered her because she knew too much about the inner workings of his cult group. The police stated that they did not see Aldrate with the group when they arrived in Mexico City. They thought that Constanzo might have buried her somewhere in the city. U.S. authorities, however, believed that Aldrate purposely left her belongings behind to confuse investigators and make it appear that she was dead. On the 24th of April, police arrested two other members who were hiding in one of Constanzo's properties in the Juarez neighborhood. The Mexico City Police Department noticed that the Matamoros killings were similar to the murders carried out in Mexico City between 1987 and 1989. After consulting local witchcraft practitioners and sorcerers, the police heard that Constanzo was probably hiding in Cuauhtémoc, one of the city's boroughs. Another contact told the police that there was an address of interest in the Veronica and Jurez neighborhood next to Cuauhtémoc. The police department sent 16 officers to search the area. At a supermarket, they interrogated a shoemaker who claimed to have seen a woman who matched Andrete's description. The police then spotted a man at a supermarket who was attempting to buy large amounts of groceries with U.S. dollars. They followed the man and saw that he was living at an apartment on Rio Sena. By the end of the week, the police included that the man was De Leon and that he was buying groceries for Constanzo. On May 6, 1989, the police surrounded the building and waited for traffic to subside before raiding the premises. However, a black vehicle pulled up in front of the apartment complex and the police walked over to investigate. Constanzo noticed the police from the window of his apartment and opened fire at the officers who were at ground level. Constanzo threw golden coins and paper money from the window and burned some of his money on the stove. Constanzo eventually ran out of ammunition and began to lose his patience. After about 45 minutes and worried of his imminent capture, Constanzo ordered De Leon to kill him and Quintana Rodriguez. De Leon hesitated at the beginning, but Constanzo hit him in the face and told him that he would suffer in hell if he did not do as he commanded. Constanzo then hugged Quintana Rodriguez and De Leon stood in front of them before he opened fire and killed the two of them with a the machine gun inside a closet. When the police climbed up the stairs and made it to Constanzo's smoke-filled apartment, Aldrate ran from the door screaming that Constanzo was dead. De Leon later confessed that Constanzo had lost his mind and was saying that everything was lost and that no one was going to have his money when the police raid forced him to barricade himself in his apartment. He also stated that he participated in Kilroy's murder and in other killings at Santa Elena, but both agreed that Constanzo did most of the killings himself. Aldrate denied participation in the killings and stated that she was unaware of them until she saw the victims on national television. She said she was sorry to hear about Kilroy's murder. She stated that she was not an official member of the cult and was barely going through the initiation. In addition, she stated that she was held prisoner during Constanzo's hiding in Mexico City. When asked if she was in love with Constanzo, she denied it and said that she was only his follower. At the scene, police took Aldrate, De Leon, Orea Ochoa, Juan Carlos Fergoso, and Jorge Montes into custody. The police also arrested Maria de Lourdes, Guerrero Lopez, and Maria del Rochillo Cuevas Guerrera, other cultists under Constanzo in Mexico City later that day. They were renting one of Constanzo's apartments. The individuals arrested that day were held for homicide, criminal association, wounding an officer, and damage to property. Fearing that Constanzo might have purposely faked his own death, investigators conducted fingerprint analysis. They concluded that the corpse was indeed Constanzo's. Constanzo's 9mm Uzi submachine gun and his supposed suitcase were never formally presented by police as seized items. On the 15th of May, a judge refused to set bail for the individuals arrested that day because they were wanted for crimes accumulating over 50 years in prison.
On the 27th of August, 1989, Orea Ochoa was admitted to a hospital in Santa Martha Acatillas after being diagnosed with AIDS. The police said that he and Eldrate were Constanzo's lovers, but that Eldrate showed no signs of the disease in her immune system. He died on the 11th of February, 1990. On June 2nd, 1989, Salvador Larcion, a police chief of the Federal Judicial Police, was indicted for drug trafficking. He was linked to Constanzo by Aldrate and other cult members who claimed he acted as the group's contact in the police. Aldrate said that Constanzo had told her that he had killed two men to favor to Garcia Alcheron. The police chief, however, defended his stance and stated that Alcheron's involvement with Constanzo was merely religious. He said that he was possessed with spirits at a young age and sought Constanzo for help. He was not charged with Kilroy's murder or for any other killings conducted by Constanzo's group. In August 1990, De Leon was sentenced to 30 years in prison for killing Constanzo and Quintana Rodriguez. Fregosa and Montez were convicted of a separate murder charge and sentenced to 35 years in prison. Reyes Busmante, the ranch caretaker, was accused in court of cover-up. He was released from prison on the 11th of December 1990 after paying a bond of $500 U.S. As of 2009, only two suspects remained at large, Ovidio and Ponce Torres, and were wanted for Kilroy's murder in Mexico. After Kilroy was confirmed dead, the media framed the drug group and their religious practices as Satanists. For the most part, the U.S. media labeled the group as Satanists and gave a little mention to the drug-related violence that was widespread in northern Mexico, thus failing to provide a wider picture of what happened at Matamoros. Reports concluded that because human body parts were found inside a large metal pot, the group practiced cannibalism. Some journalists made the error of attributing cannibalism with the common mistake of Satanist groups sacrificing and eating human moraines. Other writers, however, stated that Constanzo believed in Kedibempe, the devil in Palo Mayombe. In addition, some cult writers believe that the nature of Kilroy's murder, which included mutilation and clandestine burial, were part of a cult tradition. When media coverage and allegations of Constanzo's affinity towards Satanism died down, several Afro-Cuban scholars stated that Constanzo's actions were fueled by his personal conviction and psychopathic involvement with Palo Mayombe. They argued that Constanzo used Palo Mayombe for his own financial illicit and psychological needs by convincing his cult members to help further his drug trafficking operations. Through human sacrifice, Constanzo promised his members that they were protected from the law. Other Afro-Cuban scholars, on the other hand, alleged that Constanzo murdered Kilroy because he truly believed it was a requirement in his distorted view of Palo Mayombe. From this point of view, Constanzo's actions and what happened at Matamoros could happen anywhere. On the 20th anniversary of their son's murder, Kilroy's parents visited the Rio Grande Valley in Matamoros to thank the people who had supported them in their search for their son. Kilroy's father stated that the people were supportive and called the police whenever they saw something suspicious that they thought was related to their son's disappearance. He said that it was easier to overcome their son's death because of the support they received. Kilroy's mother said she received the cross from a Brownsville woman when she was searching for her son in 1989. Quote, it's a reminder every time that I know that the Lord was involved in everything, she said, while she touched and showed the cross around her neck. Helen Kilroy died in 2014 from ALS at age 70. Rest in peace to Mark James and Helen Josephine Kilroy. For more content, like, share, and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.